There's been another crew accident on Boris Herman's Team Malaysia boat, in the ocean race. Nico Lundvin, their navigator, went on deck on night one, and as the boat luffed, the headsail sheets whipped him in the face, leaving him like he'd been 15 rounds with Mike Tyson. Happily for Nico, he was back on the job, after the medical experienced Malaysia crew, attended to his wounds. All right. J'ai l'impression d'avoir perdu un match de boxe, mais ça va. Bah, J'ai commencé il y a une demi-heure. J'ai pas l'impression que ce soit ma... que j'ai une grande carrière. Ouais. Je vais regarder. Donc j'allais dire avant le waypoint. Ouais, entre les deux quoi. En fait, euh, tu vois là, les deux routages qui sont là, là ouais. ça c'est arpège. Okay. Parce que lui, il voit du 55 là. Okay. Donc si on a avant le waypoint, si on a grosse gauche, on peut virer avant le waypoint. Ouais. Sinon, on va à peu près jusqu'au waypoint. Ouais. Explain what happened, Nico. Just the, just the yeah, I was, uh, I was on deck, working on uh, the trickers, on uh, for the sheet, uh, the J2 sheet slip from the safe tailing. There's a safe start to, to flap quite uh, strong because it was uh, 20 knots. And I have been eaten by the by the sheet or maybe uh, a carabina, I don't know, because it was night so it was dark so I didn't see. So uh, I feel a bit like a, a box player who has uh, lost uh, his match. But it's okay. This is your Sailing Weekly Global Highlights show, The World on Water, for April 28, 2023. This week the US sailing scene comes to life with many of our reports. Firstly, the New York Yacht Club's America Magic, their AC40, joined the huge AC40 Capsize Club. Once again the Recon Video team was not on the spot to capture the event. Okay, today we have Andrew Campbell, sailor with Team American Magic. Looks like we had a bit of everything out there today. What can you tell us about it? Yeah, it felt like two different days out there today, honestly. Like the sun's out now, it's faded, and but it's still really nice northeasterly we have here. It's still kind of that cool spring weather every once in a while that keeps hanging around. And uh, But the beginning of the day was blustery and, and gusty and... Yeah, it was all on at the, for a minute there. So we, uh, we, we made the most of a, a long day, but I think it definitely felt like two different days. Yeah, yeah. Um, you guys had an interesting start to the day. Can yeah. you walk us through that? Yeah, we, I mean, these boats are not very stable in that displacement mode. So it's not quite the fastest capsize that we've had in this program. I think we've done some quicker after the spike off, but it's one of them, you know, I think we spiked off took off and spun the boat into the breeze and basically immediately capsized into windward. So um, just shows you kind of how sensitive these things really are and how hard they kick when you get it wrong. So yeah, we've had some Monday morning blues there to, to splash us in the face and wake us up. Yeah, you didn't get to stay dry very long today. No, it was a good day for the dry suits. <laughs> um, so the last two sailing days you've been at the helm. What can you tell us about it? Yeah, no, it's been fun driving the boat. It's been really good, um, you know, for me to be able to do some of the um, autopilot flight control that this system allows us to do and to see and understand how the boat reacts using that system. It's really valuable for us and um, it's been really valuable for the other guys to have another, you know, set of hands on the wheel to, to you know, learn about how to communicate and how to um, deal with um, all the, you know, changes and, and new prompts and new ideas that a new driver comes with. So um, that's all really good and healthy for us, I think. And um, it definitely opens up opportunities for us once we get two boats in the water. Copy that. So how did it compare with what expectations you had and, and you know, time in the simulator? Yeah, I mean, it's a, um, for sure, a lighter, more nimble platform than the big boat. And um, so we, you know, essentially knew what to expect from this last couple weeks of sailing, but 
Um, you know, anytime you get your hands on the wheel with a new piece of equipment like that, it's going to react differently than than maybe it, you'd expect it to. And um, that first spike off the hoist, it did, yeah. Copy that. Um, we noticed some changes on the boat. Um, what can you tell us about the the new headrest looking things and uh, the changes to the starboard foil arm? Yeah. So the uh, we had some mods going on to help us with some of our displays and with our um, you know head support on the um, middle of the boat. That's all just kind of experimenting as we move forward and and understand how um, you know sitting in small cockpits like this works and how this cockpit especially is just so you know, kind of cramped and narrow and trying to understand how to protect ourselves and, and um, keep the displays in a place where we can see them still because um, they're tucked away in that, in that one design format. And uh, we uh, did make a mod to the starboard foil. It's probably pretty obvious to most people and, um, you know, that's all part of our foil development process is just learning how it goes when it goes on, learning how it goes when it goes off and um, it's uh, slowly ticking all the boxes here for our foil designers. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks, guys. The group of international match racing sailors were absolutely swamped by local super captain, Chris Poole, and his crew. Hosted by the Long Beach Yacht Club, Poole sailed the full series without losing one match. A super demonstration of power match racing in this year's Congressional Cup. Race day one of Charleston Race Week, got off to a rousing start with ideal conditions delivering an action-packed opening day. We've reached the finals of the 58th Congressional Cup Regatta in Long Beach, California. The top two teams made it after a week of tough competition and the Belmont Pier is packed, full of anticipation and excitement. The day first began with a traditional fleet race among the bottom six teams which this year was sailed in very light breeze, but nonetheless, it entertained the crowds watching to set the mood. Then it was into the action of the main event with the best of five final to see which team would win the coveted Congressional Cup. USA's Chris Poole, the number one ranked team in the world, or the number fourth ranked team of Jeppe Bork's team from Denmark. In lighter than ideal race conditions, Chris Poole managed the pre-start superbly in his first match, slamming the Danes with an early penalty, leaving him then free to sail the course, staying ahead and notching up his first point on the scorecard. In match two, it was Poole on the receiving end of a penalty in the pre-start from the young Danish team, but in short order, they soon saw the stern of Poole's boat as they headed upwind. Around the course, there was nothing Bork could do to rein in Poole as they still had a penalty to shed before the finish to win. Coming down the final run, Poole had enough room to complete his penalty turn and still cross ahead, and so he moved up 2-0 on the scorecard. Uh, yeah, no, it was, it was a little bit of a tricky race, light air, uh, kite set on the entry, and then we went to uh, down to the boundary. Um, sorry about my guys talking with debriefing. Um, and then uh, didn't do a good job staying close enough to the boundary and yet they was able to hook us, but we were happy with that to go for a position and get some speed. And then we uh, just got off the line and Joachim called a great first beat, started to stretch away and uh, the traffic helped uh, get us enough of a gap to do a penalty turn at the finish. Meanwhile, the petite final for the third and fourth place teams was also underway with reigning world match racing tour champion Nick Egnott Johnson from New Zealand scoring two straight wins over Ian William from Great Britain who was likely still reeling from his 3-0 defeat yesterday at the hands of Bork. And now the members of the Long Beach Yacht Club and fans watching around the world ready themselves for a crucial third match. Could Bork score a point and end Poole's incredible unbeaten streak to keep his hopes alive in the regatta? Off the starting line, it was close, but Poole took the right-hand side and looked to be in better pressure. Little by little, he widened the gap, and by the final mark rounding, he had a solid lead. Bork knew well that the trailing boat can often come back downwind, but Poole's team managed the run perfectly, soaking downwind to the finish line to the massive cheers of the spectator crowd. An unprecedented, unbeaten week with 24 wins from 24 matches. It was, in his words, a perfect regatta. For Bork, it was so close and yet so far in his first Congressional Cup final, but he's sure to be back. Well, yeah, huge congrats to Chris and his team. I know he's been wanting this for so long and he's worked really hard. They were clearly way better than us today. They sailed uh, really, really well and we didn't show up for the game. 
Sorry about we couldn't give the spectators what they came for, but uh, yeah, they were just very, very good and uh, totally deserve it. So well done to them. And a champagne swim for an ecstatic Chris Poole. On to the awards presentation at the Long Beach Yacht Club with silver medals for Bork and his team. And for the first time in the event's history, Chris Poole donned the famed Crimson Blazer as he and his team received their gold medals and had the honor of lifting the Congressional Cup Trophy, adding his name to the long list of historic match race winners. Congratulations to Chris Poole and his Riptide Racing Team with an unbeaten record, scoring valuable points toward the World's Match Racing Tour title. And the first major event of the year, concluding yet another historic Congressional Cup here in Long Beach, California. Southeasterly winds ranging from 6 to 11 knots enabled organizers to complete four races for all of the inshore courses. Meanwhile, Offshore Race Committee Chairman Bruce Bingman and Ray Redness were able to give all the pursuit classes relatively long races. Welcome to day one at Charleston Race Week. My name is Taryn Teague. I'm the event PRO here at Charleston, uh, International Race Officer from Annapolis. And I'm really looking forward to a great three days of racing. This year, we are at the USS Yorktown as our event venue site. So day one of Charleston Race Week 23, it totally exceeded expectations. The air was a little bit on the lighter side, but it was seven to nine knots. I think all the circles are gonna get in four races today. And that's a great way to go into the, to the rest of Charleston Race Week over the next two days. an up and down day for us. Uh, we had a good first race. Last race we clawed back to somewhere we think in the top 10. It was a very tough day. The current was obviously a huge factor so it was it was difficult out there. Nothing nothing came easy. I think that if you you know recognizing the changeover between uh, playing the current and the shift and kind of the moments to do that and uh, was sort of the key to the day from, from, my, from my perspective. Yeah, definitely put Charleston on your list. Uh, you know, for a number of years, it's been one of the biggest events in the country, uh, it really has. Um, so you get a great turnout, a lot of great sailors, um, you know, lots to learn here. And um, you know, it's, you gotta come here and experience it for sure. For my sailing friends in Annapolis and throughout the country and elsewhere, I totally recommend that you come to Charleston Race Week next year. It's just one of those events that you just need to, need to experience. It is a regatta unlike any other. If you are enjoying this week's show, please subscribe, share and like. John Sommers skipped veracity to overall victory in the AON 2023 Etchells World Championships. Will Ryan trimmed the jib and Becky Anderson worked the bow as the New York entry posted a low score of 50 points, 10 better than runner-up Steve Benjamin and the Tons of Steel team. <laughs> April 2023, Biscayne Bay Yacht Club, Coral Reef Yacht Club, and Shake a Leg Miami came together to host the Aeon Etchells World Championship. Miami, Florida's Fleet 20 has been hosting major Etchells events for decades, 
Because of this and the stellar local facilities and race committee support, it was inevitable that 62 boats coming from nine countries with many more representatives crew would arrive for a Chamber of Commerce week of sailing. All right, my name is Mark Pickle from Germany. Hey, I'm Charlie Cumbly, I'm from the UK. My name is Morten Henriksen, I'm from Denmark. I'm Nigel Abbott from Australia. My name is Fredrik Bergstrom and I'm from Sweden, Gothenburg. I've been sailing uh, with the Renegade team for 10, 11 years now, mostly out in Bermuda. But the whole experience of doing a world, well, this little caliber of great sailors around the place, it's a real thrill to be in it. For this event, it's been uh, epic uh, in all senses of the word, super hard. But we need that super hard fleet, just a great way to go out and challenge yourself really. If you do a tiny tiny mistake, you get hit immediately. And it's just, uh, sometimes you come around the weather mark and you're deep and you look around you and say, oh, somebody else in, 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 in this leak is also pretty deep, you know? So it's fun and it's just as, as hard as it gets. The leader never extends absurds amount and everyone is super close. We have to have those long courses. Um, all the boats get the same speed, so it makes, uh, makes decision-making even harder. There's a lot of sharing between all the boats. You get a lot to learn out of it. And I do think that that's what World Championships are about. When you expose yourself to that highly tactical and technical, and then even just a straight out guesswork when you need it, that's just something pretty exciting about it. Doing that on Etchells is a, it's a lot of work. It's a lot, you've got a lot going on up there, but um, it's great that I have good teammates supporting me because as much as I have to do, it's really the back of the boat that kind of makes my life a little bit easier. And it's really great to learn as a sailor and off the water, I think we have a really great time too. We're really good teammates. And it's a lot of fun being around all these really awesome, talented people. The Etchell class looks to be the class for the future. Okay, so if you guys are interested in keyboard sailing on the highest level, get into the Etchells class. It was impossible to narrow down the contenders to a few favorites. There was a different boat rounding the first top mark every race, and a different top three practically every finish line. Lured gates were department stores on Black Friday, and even after almost 10 nautical miles of racing, the battle for the bullet sometimes came down to inches. On land, the host yacht clubs hosted parties on the lawn, poolside, at the Aeon trailer, or in the hangar always with same-day video coverage and photos from the day and Bacardi rum flowing. Going into the final day of competition, several boats were in contention for the crown, the top two being Stephen Benjamin's Tons of Steel in first and John Sami's Veracity in second place. Light air, potentially only one race before curfew. What happened? A match race to remember. Veracity knew all they had to do was ensured that Tons of Steel finished worse than their drop at the time, which was a 31st. After three legs out of four, the duo was sitting in about 28th and 29th place. Veracity needed a few more boats to pass them, and Tons of Steel needed to escape. Tensions mounted until both boats actually coasted into a foul. Penalty flags, hands, and words were flying. Other teams tried to take advantage by gaining back points, but the spreads were just a little too much to make it up in one race. When the street lights turned on, RC made everyone go back home without quite knowing who the champion was. A protest hearing determined that Tons of Steel was in the wrong and was disqualified from the race, which meant no change to the overall standings after nine races. John Somi and crew hoisted the Founders Trophy along with top crew, top master, and several race win trophies. You know, this, uh, a format like this, as any potential sale can appreciate, this is a huge team effort, and they made it through on the uh, race committee, set a dynamic race course for us, and so the reality is that we, we had dreams, I had dreams about this, and dreams can come through, and here I am, I'm, I'm so grateful. I respect every sailor in this fleet, and that's the privilege of being able to stand up here right now. So thank you all. Thank you. The top Corinthian team was David Huck's encore. And the Bill Munster Sportsmanship Trophy went to Commodore Jeff Neems, aka Nemo, for his ongoing dedication to the class behind the scenes and on the race course. Congratulations to all of the competitors. For T2P TV, this is Ashley Love.
With a first, third, and a discard on day three, Casey Imenaire of Australia sits in fourth place overall at the French Olympic Week 2023 as we move into the final series of the Ilka 6 class. So it's the final day of qualification, three race day, and two out of three ain't bad. Can you introduce yourself to me and tell us about your day? Yeah, hi, I'm Casey Imenaire from Australia, so the Ilka 6. Um, today, look, we got three races in, which was great to um, be like catch back up on schedule. Um, the first so, so we're back up to yeah. six races after three days, yep. yeah? Oh, yeah, so today um, the first race was pretty good. I came away with the win, um, had a good start and was able to lock in some boats early. Um, so that was pretty nice. And then the second race fought hard to come away with a third. Um, and then, yeah, that last race just got pretty caught out on a quite a persistent lefty. So what happened there? The wind just went left and left and left and there was no chance to come back? Or was that what you were expecting or something completely different? Yeah, well, with our, we wasn't really expecting it to go so far left. Just within um, later in the day, I was sort of expecting it to go a little bit more right. The breeze had built just before the start and, um, you know, it was starting to feel a bit nice and a bit more hiking. But then, yeah, it just changed completely throughout the race got softer and softer. <laughs> wow, I mean, sailing's a consistency sport and yeah, I mean, all the forecast would suggest it to go westerly at the end of the end of the day. Um, do you have any particular thoughts going into the Gold Fleet? Because it all changes tomorrow, the fleet will be much tougher. Yeah, I actually really enjoy Gold Fleet racing. It seems to be a lot nicer in a way. Um, <laughs> you just, you've got, um, you know, like what girls you're up against and um, some tendencies and things like that. So it always um, brings out the best in, um, in everyone and I think at the moment with Pierre's like we had the Mistral first two days and then today was a shake up and next few days will be another shake up so bringing out the person that comes out on top will be yeah consistent. And it certainly looks like it's going to be a mixed regatta so you, you like being pushed by the top girls by the sound of it. Oh of course you don't want an easy race that's for sure. <laughs> Can you just tell us a little bit about your build up because uh, obviously you've been here in Europe for, for quite a while? Yeah, so the Aussie girls, we've been um, in Europe since, well, we came for the Europeans in Andorra. So, we've, yeah, been away for quite a few weeks now. Um, we had Palmer and then this will be our final one and we'll all head home and then, yeah, start to come back over for Marseille and uh, The Hague. So can you just tell us what, what's Marseille and what's The Hague? Because they're both very important regattas. Yeah. Yep, so Marseille will have um, some training and racing and obviously we've got the test event as well. Um, and then, yeah, we'll start a lead into um, uh, The Hague, The Worlds. So that'd be good. And I, I hate to say this because people never answer me, but what do you think your strengths and weaknesses are at the moment? It's, it's hard for me not to think <laughs> this way as a coach. Well, before I used to, yeah. Um, I think str I, I do like um, hiking and getting a bit of a swing you're, on. <laughs> you're in the right class then. Yeah. Yeah, example was yesterday, just how windy it was. You'd hike so hard and like the speed was just nothing and you'd see all these 49ers just absolutely holding on and just sending it around the race course. We, we have really good close racing and we were very lucky that we were able to race in conditions other classes couldn't. Yeah, it, it's sometimes a bit of a nice feeling when you, you come in and you've braved the conditions and everyone's still on shore a little bit uneasy and on a, a, like AP and stuff and like with the laser you sort of you always kind of there's a there's you always guaranteed um a bit of racing so that's good and, and these are the conditions the mr l conditions that yeah is famous for i mean it, it means you've earned your earned your dinner yeah definitely there was definitely quite a few crepes happening in the lead up well, i'm pleased to <laughs> pleased to hear it and the other question i quite often ask and people find hard to answer who who do you think is showing good form at the moment because we're getting to to the to the tail end of the olympic campaign yeah, I, I think at the moment, like, a lot, there's a, the top 10, top 15 actually all have a lot of potential. Um, yeah, we've obviously seen some, like, standout results with Marit at the moment, but um, I think anyone in the top 15 definitely has an opportunity to win overall. Absolutely. Well, I'm looking to forward to lots more days racing. Thank you very much for your time. No worries. Bye.